I have to say this is uh, uh, probably the hardest interview I'm ever have to do. I can't stop crying. Uh -huh. let, me, let me just say that what you didn't see, even on television, was that cameramen who see everything, they have seen the worst kinds of crimes and deaths. Not one cameraman had, had a dry eye in seven days. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, and I want to get to a lot of the stuff to do the sentencing, but I want to just get some background going, and maybe that'll help me get under control here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we, we were talking before, I was just going to get a little background on you. Uh, you were the first uh, female JAG in Michigan for the National Guard. First female JAG in the history of the Michigan Army National Guard. And they didn't want me. It took me a long time to get in. I finally did get in, which is a whole other different story. But when the general swore me in, he crossed out six years, which was the commitment at that time, wrote in eight. I said, sir, please put 20. I will stay. And then once he swore me in, he said, the only thing that would have been better about you is if you were black. But that was the time back then. I did uh, stay my 20, and I became the most requested JAG officer. That's an amazing start. Um, and then I want to get... Oh, I'm sorry. It is the Judge Advocate General Corps. So I was a judge judgment. and, and a, a defense counsel at times and prosecutor at times, but it is the legal defense uh, portion of the military. Soldiers get in trouble, and we are there to defend and prosecute, and we judge differently than the civilian world. In fact, in the, and most people don't know this, we can punish a soldier in the military and then in the civilian world, they can be punished as well for the same offense. There's not double jeopardy as it applies. And uh, this was the Michigan National Guard? Michigan Army National Guard. And mm -hmm. you were already serving the Guard when you started to become the JAG? When you were fighting to become JAG? No, I uh, went to um, high school and college and law school and always thought I, this is what I want to do. My dad was in the Army and my uncle on the USS Bainbridge in the Navy. And I always wanted to do that. And so I signed up while I was waiting for my bar results. And then it took me about a year and a half to get in because I was a woman, because I was naturalized, and they really didn't want me. So what I did is I said, well, they can't say no to a volunteer. And because I learned that my paperwork had been collecting dust on a colonel's desk. So I put on my, and I was a lot younger and prettier then, <laughs> and a lot thinner. I put on my tightest jeans, my cowboy boots, and a reasonable shirt, and I volunteered and made sure I had coffee where the general had his coffee when I took a break, and had a little chat with him. And of course, he kept staring at me like, who the hell are you? And so by the time I took my coffee up to the second floor where the JAG office was in the building we were at at that time, the colonel was pointing at the phone and saying, come over here, and holding it up so I could hear the general yell, what is that woman doing? Why is she here? And the colonel said, she's volunteering. I couldn't say no to a volunteer. She's signed up. And I understand the paperwork is on the colonel's desk in the office next to you. And the general screamed, get that girl in a uniform. And I was sworn in the very next weekend. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so to this case, um, you were the sentencing judge. Yes. Now, how does that happen? Because you weren't the judge for the trial? He pled. We were set up for a trial. His attorneys, we have in the legal system, there's a lot of, you know, making the sausage that you don't need to know, you don't want to know it. But what we do is we have a lot of meetings and make sure that the trial is all set up. And at that time, I had met with both attorneys prior, weeks prior, months prior, and they said, we're ready to go to trial, and we set our, all the parameters up and how we're going to have a jury. Uh, we, I, saw, I ordered 800 jurors, thinking that this would take four to six weeks at least. And I told the attorneys we needed a special um, questionnaire. So we had written a questionnaire that was eight to ten pages long. So what we were going to do for is jurors. bring in... For jurors. Bring in, a questionnaire yeah. for jurors? Yes. So okay. we were going to bring them in, not just the normal one that you all fill out, but once you got there, we were calling in batches of 200. They would sit in the jury room, fill them out, and then we would sit at night and do the yes, 
the maybe and the hell no pile, and then eventually a limit, limit uh, who we were going to use in our final voir dire to see what jurors we would get. Now, I had been assured by defense counsel that they had experts, and so to defend in their case. And my father and brothers are doctors, and I figured, okay, you know, this is going to be the cross between a medical malpractice case and a criminal case, and there are breakthroughs in medicine all the time. I, I had no idea. I didn't know anything about this case. I had never met Nasser. And then the Wednesday before Thanksgiving on my docket, because people have a tendency of not showing up, I don't schedule anything, and then I can use it for arraignments or other things I do. So they came to me the week before and said, we are pending jury selection, which was set for the Monday after Thanksgiving. Will you accept a plea at this late date? Right. And I said, what's the plea? So he had, I think it was, I think in the film it says 25, but I think it was 28 or 29 counts. And the plea was that he would plead to seven first uh, degree criminal sexual conduct charges, which each carry a life offense, and then they would not issue any charges on more child pornography that they found on his cell phone. And I said, okay, but I always let everybody speak, and the, the people said, well, that's part of our deal, is he's going to, we want the victims to speak. And I said, well, not just in the seven counts. They said, no, we, we agree, not just in the seven, but other victims, and I said, you understand? I mean everyone. I read victim to be everyone who was uh, affected by the case, so that would include parents, doctors, whoever wanted to speak. And defense counsel said, well, there are doctors and coaches and other people who want to speak, and we don't want them to. I said, then appeal me, but that's always been my rule for 15 years. You all know that. I am going to let everybody speak without limit for as many days as it takes. Ultimately, I listened to 169. 156 I dubbed uh, sister survivors. Um, so at the point at which they were saying, okay, we don't want certain people to speak, um, and were they gonna say, we won't make this plea if you're gonna let everyone speak, or was there, was there a negotiation about that? No, there really wasn't. I just, my rule is if you don't like what I do, then appeal me. Obviously they, they didn't appeal that part. It is, part of it is on appeal. Uh, everything has been denied by the Court of Appeals. There is a portion, so there's some things I can't talk about, but there's a portion where uh, what they've accepted is to review the case to see if I was biased which I don't know how I can be biased when he got his, the benefit of his plea agreement. Um, I gave him 40 years. The plea agreement was I could sentence on the minimum 25 to 40 years, and then I would set the maximum. The maximum of 175 was really easy for me once I heard everything and looked at everything, and his letter just jarred me. And his attitude and not paying attention to the girl's demeanor says a lot to juries and to judges. And so I took seven counts times 25, 175. As to the minimum, again, seven counts. But if you divide seven into 40, that's about five point, my math is, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, it's, usually it's okay. attorneys are not, but Sorry. it's something like 5.7 years per count. That's, a, that's like a drunk driving. <laughs> okay. and. There were thousands of crimes that I heard during those seven days that were never issued on. And although I can't uh, consider those in sentencing, I considered the seven, even those seven had hundreds of crimes against them that were never issued on. And I had a defendant who kept saying it was treatment, and I kept asking him, would you like to withdraw your plea? Multiple times, and he kept saying no but he never got it. He still, to this day, calls it treatment. Yeah. Uh, well, and uh, you also said something that you, uh, you can't talk about, but that, that is sort of uncanny to me. You said everything's being appealed? He appealed, well, first of all, with the federal case. Okay. That was the worst, and that federal judge says openly, that is the worst child pornography she's ever seen. I can't even imagine it. I have seen some on cases, and it's horrific. So she says it's the worst. So she has an option, and in certain cases, judges have options to either let the time serve altogether or separately. So she 
found 20 plus 20 plus 20. So he'll have to serve 60 years and then my sentence. And so, but you know, she's a female judge, I'm a female judge, and then Judge Cun Cunningham, where there was that fight, uh, is a female judge. Think about this, he also had a female prosecutor and a female detective. And he still wants control of all of us, and we weren't having that. Um, so he thought he could beat the system. And I, I truly believe that he appealed the federal judge saying it should be 20 years that runs all together. And the court there has said no. He appealed um, Judge Cunningham as well in her sentence. She sentenced 40 to 125 years on three counts. So she actually charged heavier than me because there were three counts. So it's what, 11 or so years per piece, a piece, right? And then he charged me with all sorts of things on appeal. They said no to everything except the one they're looking at to see if I was biased. They're claiming, like he did, because uh, his appeal, that I did this for some kind of notoriety, for some benefit to me. Um, I was harsh in talking to him. I let everybody speak. I don't know what they're ultimately going to do with me. But if I get pissed off, I'll just walk off the bench and lobby for the changes so that every judge can do what I do without harassment. Well, and, and, and well said. Um, and you, you said that, um, so in, in essence, he's appealing sentencing because he can't appeal the conviction because he pled, right? Right. So, so he, he wants, he really wants, for me, he thought he could just do all this and then gain control, you know, the tw only 20 years in the feds and then 25 instead of the 40 for me. So right. maybe he'll get out when he's a very old man because my sentence and the judge who sentenced after me, ours do run together. But, uh, so he'll serve those 40 years together. But in, by appealing, he's saying, look, you know, I needed the lower end. This wasn't that bad, it was just malpractice. Yeah, he just well, doesn't get it. No, no he's clearly He's a true not. predator. Clearly and not. truly, all predators want control. And you can see um, through the film, I think that's really the message and why this conversation is important, to learn about grooming and predatory behavior and what we all can do to change a broken system. Well, I think that's, tr that's true, and I, I want to go back to something else you said before, which is that you've been doing this for 15 years, letting victims speak, and this is, this is an identifiably your thing, and I guess other judges do this too, or is this Apparently uniquely not. to you? Apparently not. I, I think um, it's somewhat unique to you. I, I let everybody speak. The Crime Victims' Rights Act says a victim. I read victim very broadly. I didn't know that I would come under criticism from other judges who've sent some, not, not many, but a few have sent me how, uh, emails saying, how dare dare you, now we have to do it. <laughs> um, oh, tough. Okay, and the thing is, I don't just let victims speak. I read it um, broadly, first of all, so victim has no border. There is nobody, no victim can ever show me where the pain ended or where it didn't affect their mother, their brother, their family, their uncle, their best friend, their partner. Crime has a huge rippling effect, and I think that we have an obligation to recognize that. There's also supposed to be a deterrence factor, and so defendants need to hear just how deeply and just how expansive the crime they caused, the, you know, the pain went, and how much damage they caused. So I also let defendants speak too, not just uh, because it's their time to talk, but I also let their family and friends speak as well. And it's always been interesting to me because when each side hears the other and there's some understanding, there's release of pain on both sides and many defendants because they don't have a mommy and daddy like most of us have. They didn't know they hurt someone that badly. They didn't have any empathy for another human being. Many defendants, I say, if you've done this, you can certainly do great things in the world. Come back and show me what you've done. And because most people do come out of prison. And if we've treated them right, if we tell them they also matter and not to let the crime define them, then they come out and they do do better. If we treat them poorly, they do not have a scarlet letter. So we don't know if they're in our movie theaters, in our churches, in our grocery stores and what anger they have, and what bullets they want to shoot and do shoot at us. So I really believe that our gavels as judges should really be used as healing wands when we can. And I see a lot of healing, and I have the outcome of what I do over the 15 years. I have people bringing me their artwork, their healthy babies. Their, I just received an AA coin from someone that 
uh, has been 10 years sober and said thanks to you. And it really isn't me, as I explained to everyone, it's, it's that they did the hard work and they say, you know, you're the first person to tell me I mattered, the first person to believe me and hear me. And that mattered to me and you changed my life. And I would hope that every judge would do that. And sadly, they don't. But there are judges across the United States now who've asked me to come and talk to them because I think there is an outcry for change and that's why I'm here and talking about this. I'm not really talking about the girl's story because that's their story. Our story is let's fix a broken system and keep the conversation going until there is eradication of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, child abuse. Uh, incredible. And we, we, we do have to wrap up shortly, but yeah. I do want to get to one part that's, that was not in the film it, it, and that I read about, um, and this is getting tough for me again, um, but uh, the, 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 the benefits for the victims in this particular story um, to, be, to be able to speak and the more of them that came forward, uh, that alone was a magnificent uh, accomplishment. And for them to get some kind of process, and as they say, it's not over, it'll never be over, but it gives them a, a stepping stone to another place. Um, but what was told in the story in the Times, I don't know how many people read this, but uh, while you were letting them speak, it was not only the last one who spoke that you said something afterwards. After, and yes. every, and I'll just say this because she might not uh, say it clearly enough uh, for me. Uh, but each, each person that spoke, each victim that spoke, when they were done speaking, as moving as it was for them, the judge they gave them encouragement, saluted them for coming forward, and said how strong they were, and said that they were heroes, and gave them something to take away with them. So. Those very strong women, remember they were babies, really. They were six years old and, and older uh, throughout what he did to them. And it took so much courage for them. And I know this because I've listened. I was an attorney for 20 years before I took the bench and then 15 years listening to victims. I know how impactful it is when they speak. I also know how difficult. And so when each one of them spoke, I wrote something down so that I could tell them something personal to them. In fact, in one woman, she said, I, I, I can't write anymore. I can't sing anymore. And I said, Le you know, leave your pain. And I know that this baby, she, and she said, and I'm pregnant, and I said, I know that you will now write a lullaby because you've let go of all this pain. And they, she did. And what they did is they not, they didn't just leave their pain, they empowered themselves. They took their power back and they empowered each other. And I had therapists calling me, emailing me, saying, what about you? Aren't you feeling this? And I have to say no. And it's not that I don't watch this and cry inside. But let me just say, they came in very shy, forlorn, and as they spoke, they grew. They grew 10 feet. And then when I spoke to them, they, they had a light around them. And I watched them, I felt them heal. And they empowered me to go to the next one and the next one. And ultimately, 156 spoke we believe now there is 100, uh, 505 who've come forward. I know there's still hundreds who have not. But I have to say, each time they spoke, it was like being handed a new baby. You forget about the pain. You just feel the joy. And that's what I felt. And they have a, a lot of healing yet to do. But that was really their big first step to say, I am not a number. I am a name. You hurt me. And damn it, I'm taking my power back. And it was, it was God given to me because I'll never have so many um, pillars of strength come before me like that. It was, I, I credit them. Well, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So thank you very, very much. I, I will have time. Thanks a lot. We have to move out for the, uh, the next film, unfortunately, because it's about to start. Um, but uh, thank you so much for coming out and uh, for hearing what the judge has to say. And I think we should all work towards what she's talking about in terms of the justice system and everywhere else. Thank you so much. Thank you.